So the question here is, has globalization changed the nature of diplomacy? And what do I mean by globalization, right? So, you know, I'm just going to go about and try to find a definition of what is globalization according to uh, my Google, okay? So, okay. All right, okay, okay. So according to Google, okay, according to Google, it defines globalization as the process by which businesses or other organizations develop international influence or start operating on an international scale. So let's just put it this way. Uh, it's just, you know, it's an evolving system where, you know, you have economies, you have the practice of diplomacy, you have business trade, uh, which are evolving as we speak. And it's all part of globalization. And if you don't realize this uh, or come to terms with it, I think, uh, you know, you might be at the short end of the stick per se, but uh, let's just go ahead and uh, ramble on, okay, with this. So before I start my answer for this question here, I'd like to define what is diplomacy, okay? Because we need diplomacy at this era, okay? A lot of people would say, you know, the ancient kind of globalization uh, is always rhyming with today's kind of globalization. And the same goes with diplomacy as well. The practice of ancient diplomacy is always evolving, but the nature, you know, and, and the heart of the practice of diplomacy hasn't changed yet because, well, I think uh, human beings, I think we're still the same, I would say. Um, and we have, you know, uh, similar morals as, you know, our ancient, pe our ancient uh, people had. So, um, yeah, let's just uh, define what is diplomacy, first of all. So, you know, I always go by uh, one of the books that I think it's almost like the Bible of diplomacy, okay? So this is the book here, Satire's Diplomatic Practice. It's a very coherent and a very detailed book of diplomacy. And I don't know if anybody of you are interested in diplomacy, but I reckon reading this book, uh, it does you know, give you a lot of insights and a lot of uh, practical and theory-based uh, knowledge and wisdom, if you uh, if you read into it. But the definition of diplomacy, according to Satow, he says, I quote, diplomacy is the application of intelligence and tech to the conduct of official relations between the governments of independent states, extending sometimes also to the relations with dependent territories and between governments and international institutions. Or more briefly, the conduct of business between states by peaceful means. So that's the definition of diplomacy, guys. All right. Okay, we have a question from here from, uh, what's your name here? Madman, we have a question from Madman here. He, he's asking, small request to uh, all, Help a poor needy around you every day. Smile and make others smile. Well, thank you for your uh, kind request. And I think everybody has heard Mr. Madman saying this. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to uh, take that um, seriously, okay? Thank you very much. So, you know, actually, I kind of um, printed out one of the articles that was written by Francis Campbell. He's a former UK ambassador to the Holy See, okay? And I actually, why I, I kind of picked this article was because, you know, I feel like sometimes people usually write really good pieces of work. And I think this is one of them. And I feel like maybe, you know, uh, I can maybe break it down so that my kind of narrative blends in with his kind of narrative. and. Uh, and many others as well. And, you know, we'll, we'll try to make sense out of it and maybe we can apply to our 
lives, right? Okay. Well, we have uh, we have quite a lot of viewers here, but uh, thank you for joining in, guys. I appreciate it. So, guys, I just I, I just want you to know that uh, I'm from the state of Nagaland, which is in the northeast part of India, and my state is part and parcel of the northeast region, which is you know comprised of eight states particularly okay you know the eight states not necessarily have to be uh from this you know similar ethnic background or religious background per se but uh you know i think we do have similarities and one of the magic ingredients of the eight northeast states is that we have similar boundaries we share the same boundaries and also we comprise of the two only two percent of Indians territory. So there you go. All right, guys. Uh, welcome, guys. Welcome. I appreciate for coming in. So my question here is, guys. I'm just trying to answer this, and let's let's all try to kind of delve into this question, and you know, uh, let's try to answer it, and let's try to uh, comment, debate, and maybe uh, you can point us in the right direction if you think we're headed in the wrong direction, okay? All right. So I, I kind of, uh, I'm gonna quote a lot from Francis Campbell. So it's, you know, I wanna cite this and I just wanna point, point this out that, it, you know, it's definitely not copyright, but uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a, a footnote or a citation. Okay. So, the question is, has globalization changed the nature of diplomacy? Okay, we have already discussed what is globalization, right? So I think, uh, you know, let's kind of delve into what uh, he says first, Mr. Francis Campbell, who was the former UK ambassador to the Holy See, which is uh, the Vatican, if you didn't know, by the way. And uh, I, think, uh, I, I, I think he's one of the guys who came to my university once, uh, I'm not sure if it's Campbell, okay, but Francis Campbell, but I did meet the ambassador of the Holy See and it was a very uh, honorable time. He did a kind of like a conference slash a lecture and I thought it was very interesting. All right. Okay, you're right. Is this okay? All right. Okay, so let's, number one, I think what we're going to do here, we, we kind of want to break down the answer, okay, for this question here. So first one, we'll try to speak on globalization, okay? And second one, uh, we'll, we'll speak on diplomacy, right? And third, uh, to say something of the contemporary challenges faced by diplomacy, okay? Overall, uh, we'll try to show that it is an increasingly globalized and interconnected world that we live in, okay? But nonetheless, diplomacy still remains intact. Uh, the practice of it, the theory of it, and, you know, also the, the nuts and bolts of diplomacy still remains intact despite globalization, right? Okay. All right, okay. Guys, I'm just trying to figure out the right angle for my uh, video here. So we have people joining in. Thank you very much for joining in, guys. The question here is, has globalization changed the nature of diplomacy, all right? So I hope you get that. And uh, please comment uh, so that we can debate, uh, discuss, and maybe we can try to find some solutions towards uh, what is happening in your community and my community or your personal life also okay all right thanks a lot natalie thank you for the gifts all right so you know there's a course of opinions okay and there's a diverse voices a lot of people who are questioning the utility of diplomats okay in the modern area some even ask if it is necessary in this age of instant communication like we have here, like the phone and the laptop, you know, and probably like the iPhone, uh, sorry, the Apple Watch or, you know, 
I don't know if they have Apple rings too, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'd, I would predict like in a couple of years, we're going to have like rings where, you know, we'll be able to uh, telephone somebody, do a video uh, voice conference, um, et cetera, et cetera, whatever, you know. And I think someday we might be able to put a chip in our brain. I think there's some studies already that's going on, you know, the the extent of communication, the extent of technology that is that is so rampantly, you know, overtaking our, um, you know, our, our lives, you know. Um, I don't know if you've heard about Michio Kaku. He's uh, kind of like a scientist. He's a professor in New York University. And he does talk about planting chips in the brain and also he does have a very good knack on the string theory as well, and also the black, black hole. Uh, if you're interested in physics or, you know, um, astronomy, I think uh, you should definitely read Michio Kaku's book, uh, The Future of Humanity. I would definitely recommend that. I haven't read the whole thing, but I did read a couple of chapters, and it's very interesting. I actually watch his podcast as well. Um, sorry, his radio, uh, radio channel, uh, the fantastic, science fantastic. I think you can Google that, okay? So anyways, I'm just going to move on with the question here of the changing nature of diplomacy here, right? So, you know, some claim, okay, that there is no distinct diplomatic position per se, okay? Nowadays, because I think, you know, the fact that diplomacy was so secretive, so, you know, coherent on, you know, bilateral communications that, you know, over time with the whole boom of technology and, you know, the, the speed of communication, you know, things have definitely changed, I would say, you know, and, you know, God forbid, you know, where we're headed to, but, you know, what the author here, Francis Campbell, the ambassador for the Holy See, the UK ambassador, points out that although the communication has changed over time, you know, uh, the, the nature of diplomacy still remains intact. And I kind of agree on that, to be honest. Um, I don't know if you would disagree or agree, but uh, let's go from there, okay? Guys, uh, so please feel free to comment uh, anything, okay? Uh, I, I'd, I'd be very appreciative. So what is meant by globalization? Okay, I'm gonna quote by Francis Campbell again here. I quote, for David Hell and his co-authors, it is widening, deepening, and speeding up the world's view interconnectedness, interconnectedness in all aspects of contemporary social life. But getting an agreed definition is much easier than getting agreement on a start date or its effects. Unquote. So for some globalization emerged as kind of like the new era of uh, globalization, which is, you know, after the Cold War era. And also, you know, um, you have, you know, telegrams during that time, especially the Russia uh, diplomacy, Russian diplomacy and American diplomacy was uh, was was very heated up during that time. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the Kennan's telegram, but uh, if you're into, you know, if you do follow like the current events uh, or say per se the Cold War events, uh, you will definitely hear about the telegram that was sent by the American ambassador from Russia, from Moscow to the United States of America, warning them that there's kind of like a different narrative here and it's not a good thing. So people in America should be careful of that, right? So I think that's uh, that's the context of the Cold War narrative of diplomacy. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. So <clears throat> by the end of Cold War, right? Uh, with the breaking down of borders and the opening up of systems to greater interdependence. So we're talking about the Berlin Wall, Wall as well, which was broken down, you know, um, around approximately during the Cold War era, right? Uh, which was fueled by twin forces of technology and 
uh, economic liberalization. Okay, guys, so I'm going to talk about economics and finance also today because it's very important uh, when, it, when you speak about globalization. Okay, so the latest phase of globalization, and I'm going to quote from uh, Campbell again, the latest phase of globalization is no doubt a burst fueled by technology, but all is relative and the pace of change caused by other developments in human history will also have ushered in eras which are likely to have had equally strong effects on earlier generation of humanity. So this might be a little bit of a very deep narrative per se. Uh, okay, guys, we have a question here. We have a question from Palong Naga. Okay. So what does Palong Naga have to say? So can you explain me why we Nagas are known as Chinese, even though we are Indians? Okay. So, you know, I'll be very blunt here. Okay. If you look at me, um, my ethnicity does not resemble the Indo-Aryan stock, which is and the Dravidian stock, uh, stock, which is which is part and parcel of the Indian diaspora, which is the majority of people. Uh, we comprise from we are we are comprised from the eastern part of uh, Asia. So I don't know. Maybe back in history, you know, uh, we're part from that part of the world, and we moved here towards the Southeast Asia and along the South, you know, South Asian countries. Um, or maybe we were, we were here for a long time and, you know, they came by. So, yeah. Uh, so it's a mystery for me, I think, uh, where we come from, you know, all that stuff. I kind of, I think history is very important, especially from where you come from. But uh, let's just cut it short here because uh, I feel like, you know, I haven't studied much on the history uh, per se of, uh, of Nagas, I'm still studying about it. So I'm not very credible to point that out this time, but maybe tomorrow or maybe my next podcast, I'll delve more into that, okay? But that's my answer, okay? I hope that is sufficient for you. All right, okay. So we have, uh, we have about, well, yeah, I think 100 plus viewers, so okay. We're picking up steam, guys. All right, so guys, we're still on globalization and diplomacy, okay? Uh, has diplomacy changed due to globalization, okay? So according to one of the authors by, who is studying in Yale University, okay? His name is Nayan Chan Chanda. Okay, Nayan Chanda from Yale University points out, okay? That globalization is simply a new world to describe an old process, which is so true. Because, you know, if you think about it, you know, uh, there are remnants of the old when you think about globalization. And people don't realize that. People think, oh, you know, just because of the Internet, um, you know, mobile phones and all that stuff, satellites, uh, you know, globalization has not to do with the O, but I think it has a lot to do with the O, right? All right, thank you, NAMS. I don't know if I think you are the NAMS that I'm that I know of, but uh, anyways, thank you very much. Okay, so Chanda again who's from Yale University, he also points out that globalization is not a new phenomenon. There you go. He also says that, agrees on that, awesome. But a process of interconnectedness, which owes much to four groups, traders, preachers, adventurers, and warriors. Okay, guys, by the way, the person who asked, where do you think uh, we come from? I think we were part of the warrior. Um, society, per se, especially people from Nagaland. Uh, but uh, don't count me fully on that, okay? We have another question here, guys. So what do you think of the EU becoming a mini superpower? That's a solid question, I think. I don't know your name. Uh, you can always write your name there, but is that's TID, okay? Uh, okay. So the answer to your question is, why do you think the, the EU becoming a mini superpower? 
I think, you know, you know, it kind of goes back to even the economics of it. Uh, okay, I just wrote this down, by the way. So, you know, the, you know, European, if you, I actually spoke about, the, you know, the, the member states of uh, European uh, Union. So currently they have 27 uh, member states, okay? And Britain is a former member of the European Union, okay? So they're getting traction and they have gained traction ever since the, the accession or the creation of the European Union um, um, during 19th century. Sorry, Britain came into uh, action in 1973. Sorry, not EU. EU goes back a long time ago. But you know, uh, it, it it is. So the question here again is, guys, uh, the EU becoming a mini superpower. Okay, I'll just give you a very simple answer here. There is a reason why the EU is one of the most yeah, powerful, uh, you know, union in the world is because they have 0.52, so 526 trillion dollars in reserves in their economy. So, so let's talk GDP, let's talk economics, let's talk money, right? And also they have a unification of 26 member states, uh, which is pretty much the whole of Europe. Uh, together and which was the dominating power mm -hmm. during those days, you know, uh, and uh, and until today, you know, most of the biggest companies, the industries, uh, are in the West, you know, and also in the East. I would say, uh, especially in Japan and China and Hong Kong, right? So, yes, the currency, man, it's the currency that is very powerful. Sometimes money drives people nuts and. Um, it's not for everybody, but I think it's it's partly true for you know international uh, politics or you know uh, you know if you talk about powers. So I hope that answer is sufficient for you. If you have any other comment, please let me know. All right, okay, I'm going to move on here. So, so I, I spoke about a Yale University professor, right? Now I'm going to be speaking about a professor from Harvard, okay? His name is Danny Roderick, okay? And he wrote the book, Globalization Paradox, The Globalization Paradox. In that book, okay, he describes, right? The current phase of globalization has hyper-globalization, okay? So he even puts it in a more excessive manner where he's saying that the current phase of globalization is hyper -globa globalization. So yeah, you can always think about your hyper uh, brother or your sister who never tends to uh, sit peacefully, right? But is always moving around and trying to, you know, pick a fight or whatever, right? So that, 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 that's the phase of globalization that we are experiencing according to Danny Roderick, okay? Uh, some of the many drivers of change are also showing, uh, such as altering faster than any time in history. So the world is kind of changing uh, and sort of altering uh, history as well. That's what he's saying. For example, he quotes Chanda from the Yale University as well. In 19, sorry, in 1453, it took 40 days for the Pope to hear the fall of Constantinople, right? So we're still talking about, you know, the Vatican, right? Or the Holy See per se. And, you know, during 1943, what happened? Uh, Constantinople fell, right? So when it fell, you know, obviously the Pope is, you know, almost like the king, the monarch. Uh, he didn't come to know until 40 days, you know, but, <laughs> In 2001, what happened during 9-11, right? The Twin Towers fell and it was live in, you know, and uh, in, in the TVs, um, um, probably in our, you know, uh, I don't know if there were phones that time. Uh, probably there were Blackberry phones, I think. But yeah, it was, uh, it was very sudden and everybody, you know, 
we were watching live on TV. So that's how, you know, globalization has changed. Okay, guys, we have another question here. Okay. So the question is from the ID person, again, without the name here, who is anonymous. At this pace of globalization, isn't it going to be useless to have nations? Well, I think that's a very thoughtful question. I was thinking about it today when I was doing my research. And I think you're right. Uh, sometimes we believe that, you know, uh, there's not a need for nations because everything is unified. Everything uh, has developed in human history in such a way that everything is connected, you know, uh, through the power of the internet or the power of technology. Um, but, you know, I think what I think, okay, is, you know, sometimes if you really think about what's happening in Brexit as well, um, what happened to Brexit and, um, you know, the withdrawal of UK from the EU during 2020, it goes to show that, you know, it not necessarily it has to be, um, you know, everybody in one Kumbaya uh, utopia, uh, world utopia, because, you know, many countries also want their own sovereignty. And, you know, it could be for many reasons that uh, th that they benefit from their own sovereignty, which is usually, you know, economic trade um, and, you know, sometimes military power as well, because one of the main key ingredients for any sovereign country, sovereign country, um, our nation state is, you know, their their use of military uh, and navy and you know the army. You know, uh, there there there's some there's some kind of a you know uh, nationalistic agenda, which is very primarily happening, uh, you know, with you know our our current American president, who is Donald Trump. You know. Okay, we have another question. We have some comments here, and we have some gifts here as well. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, RJ Naga. Okay, Melvin, yes, Melvin had a very good question. Well, thanks for sharing. Well, you know, I think you guys are talking among yourselves, so let me leave it there, okay? Uh, I'm getting a little confused uh, with the comments. So anyways, um, so I I'm going to quote another book here, okay? Um, Neil Ferguson, okay? Neil Ferguson, he wrote a book. And the book is called The Rise and Demise of the British World Order and the Lessons of Global Power, okay? Uh, so Ferguson writes, one of those earlier phases of globalization, the British phase, he cites, okay, that globalization effects of the British Empire in the 19th century points out that the British Empire controlled over a quarter of the world's land mass which is true. Uh, definitely, you know, if you think about what the British had done to the world, it pretty much ruled in many parts of the world besides, well, um, India, oh, well, India got its independence in 1947. America got its independence from the 13 colonies in 1776. And it goes, you know, and it goes on. But, uh, you know, they did rule for a long time, I would say. So <clears throat> over a quarter of the world's land masses, the seas, the oceans, and the world economy, Uncoat. So, you know, at that time, I think what the British did was they kind of revolu revolutionized global communications, right, and the global order, right. Um, also, I would say what the British was doing during that time, uh, they had a different kind of communication network. Uh, they built a kind of a, a very easy, you know. Uh, so, thank you guys for your comments. Uh, Yes, I'm going to jump back and forth from uh, from my, you know, <clears throat> narrative percent, and also I look at the comments. Okay, I always follow up, so hang in there, guys. So the British built a very, you know, very coherent and a very, um, you know, very I wouldn't say complex, but they built a, a very effective communication system, which was steamships, right? Yeah, you have railroads, and you have also the telegrams, right? Um, so you have a lot of railroads in India, particularly during the British Raj in West Bengal and all the way to the ports, right? 
So this is exactly what China is doing as well. What China is doing with the Belt and Road Initiative is they're building a lot of communication networks, particularly satellites, right? The Chinese are bringing the telephone satellites, devices and all that to Africa and Middle East and many parts of Asia and fixing it up so that, you know, um, I'm not saying they're going to spy on them particularly, but I think they're building a kind of a network where, you know, they can trade um, and not just the African people, but even the, you know, the Chinese people, right? And railways, you know, um, trams, even like Chinese buses are everywhere in Africa and Middle East and uh, many parts of the world, I would say. Even in the UK, if you, I don't know if I'm 100% sure, but as far as my research is concerned, yes, in Africa, uh, if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Also, you just Google, I won't say Google, you can uh, YouTube um, some of the, you know, the Chinese in Africa or China in Africa, you'll see like thousands of hits what the Chinese are doing in Africa. They're investing pretty much the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, as, as a revival of the Silk Road, okay, which used to pass all the way from, you know, China to Mongolia, all the way to the Middle East and Europe. So it has revived, okay. And it's a, it's a very big project, but uh, I will talk about this some other time. What we're talking about is globalization, right? But it's all part of that, okay? So yes, the British, they, they built steam ships, railroads, and the telegraph. The empire established also a free trading system built on what? Banking and legal framework, okay? So this is what I was talking to you in my previous podcast about what Northeast India can possible, possibly achieve, uh, which is, you know, a unified nation state, the eight sisters, or I don't know if Assam wants to join, you guys can join or not. You can stick to stick, a, you know, your your foot in someone else. Uh, land. I don't I don't care. OK. Uh, neither do I care for uh, some other states, you know, uh, but. Anyways, I don't want to go too much into it because I already spoke about it last time. So, um, yeah, anyways. So what happened during the British Empire is they built a very effective trading system, which is banking and legal framework, uh, which is actually, it coincides, you know, it, it's, it's coincides with what's, you know, uh, what we have in the, in the system here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a remnant of what the, you know, the old system was, okay. It's just, it's just a little more complex, I would say. Okay. Okay. So let's quote uh, somebody from Asia, okay. In one of his books here. Um, so Kenichi Ohome, okay. In his book, Borderless, Borderless World uh, which was published in 1990, okay? He wrote, okay, Kenichi Ome, he wrote. He's probably Japanese, I would say. But uh, uh, anyways, let's give it a go. He says, the global economy is becoming so powerful that it has swallowed most consumers and corporations and made traditional national borders along, almost disappeared, sorry, and pushed bureaucrats, politicians, and the military towards the status of declining industries. Well, 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 what do we have here? So we have globalization, which is overpowering, you know, uh, what used to be called, you know, the, you know, the national treasures, which is bureaucrats, politicians, and the military, right? So, yeah, you know, things are changing. Okay, guys, we have... Uh, we have people talking here and I will just leave it at there because I think you guys are uh, having a very good conversation. But if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free. So by the way, the author name, okay, I think, uh, can you spell the name, please? We have a question here. Uh, so his name is called Kenichi Ohame. So K-E-N-I-C-H-I-O-H-M-A-E. 
and the book is called Borderless World, uh, which was published in 1990. So if you are interested in globalization, if you're interested in, you know, the 21st century um, per se, uh, so yeah, you should definitely grab that book, okay? While it was, you know, true that I would say Europeans when, uh, so let's go back to Europe again. Uh, Europe was united, okay? I've already spoken to you about this, about the whole unification of Germany, um, you know, the Westphalia order, you know, the Prussian custom union and all that stuff, right? I've already spoken to that about uh, in my previous podcast. So the author says, the hopes were somewhat misplaced as all divisions which has been displaced by the Cold War resurfaced. While the world did make strides towards economic independence that did not translate into an independent political space and there was no parallel development of a global ethnic consciousness. Okay, so okay, I'm just going to briefly uh, swift, swiftly go through all this. Okay. So here's the question again, okay. What brings us to the changes of diplomacy in the narrative of globalization, okay? So I'm gonna quote another author here, okay, guys? Uh, so it's called Amartya Sen, Amartya Sen. He's probably a Bengali, okay? He's, he sees globalization as enriching the world scientifically and culturally and benefiting many people economically as well, okay? So that's, that's one view, okay? So, you know, Amartya Sen, who's saying that globalization sort of enriches the world scientifically and culturally, right? And benefiting many people uh, economically as well. Okay, so that's Amartya Sen's point of view. So let's go to... Number two, who is Joseph Still Stiglitz and George Soros, okay? Joseph and George Soros, okay? They see it as a perpetuating inequality through a form of trickle-down economics mm -hmm. and trade, which is unregulated, all right? So that's the two polarizing uh, perspective, per se, and I think you get that already, okay? Um, so somebody asked, you know, why is, you know, you becoming so powerful, which kind of goes back to uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz and George Soros' uh, argument, who sees it as kind of like a inequality of economics, inequality of you know uh, legal rights, inequality of citizenship rights, and all that stuff that's happening with globalization. You know um, that uh, you know it is bound for people like you who will ask. You know, okay, you know what's happening with globalization. You know, um, it's not really good for us. Uh, so that kind of thing. Okay. Benedict, Benedict 16, okay. Benedict 16, guys, whoever is Catholic here, uh, I'm pretty sure you will recognize the name here. Okay. So Benedict number 16, he's, he, his point of view is he did not reject globalization outright. Okay. So guys, I'm bringing up like very important people here who think uh, what globalization, globalization is from their perspective. And, you know, I'm kind of like um, bringing it all together, you know, so that we, we kind of, uh, you know, we'll pick and choose which is, you know, which is right for you and me, right? So Benedict 16, he didn't reject globalization outright, unlike, you know, uh, many other authors or intellectuals or leaders. But he did see the need for a more forceful implementation of common rules and standards. Okay. So again, um, so basically, I think, obviously, you know, the Catholic Pope would definitely say that because, you know, uh, there there's a lot of rules and standards in in the church per se. And that's why you have the separation of the church and the state, you know, which was, which, which took place during the French revolution. Okay. So uh, politically and religiously, sometimes it, uh, it clashes, I would say, you know, but not necessarily always. 
Okay. But globalization is kind of making it a little more difficult for us to kind of blend in together, but at the same time, it also blends in. Okay. All right. Okay. So with, you know, with the advancement of technology development, uh, there's always, there's also a significant blurring of boundaries and borders. Okay. And the state has ceded some powers to multilateral entities. Okay, guys, this is very interesting here. So, you know, over time, like, you know, globalization has taken over our lives, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that don't kind of make sense to us. Okay, but what's happening behind the scenes is there's a lot of multilateral diplomacy that is going on um, behind doors. Okay, and also uh, in, in the open field as well. So, you know, leaders who come, you know, in the United Nations or who do like a conference in the embassy or the consulate or any official conferences, what they do is usually they do a multilateral kind of a diplomacy where, you know, many countries come together, you know, envoys or ambassadors or uh, consular officials per se, and they do this kind of like what you call a conference diplomacy and also a multilateral diplomacy, which was uh, not exactly how it was, you know, in the ancient kind of diplomacy uh, per se. So what kind of diplomacy I'm talking about in the previous ancient times is, okay, so basically, um, so you have the Byzantine, Byzantine diplomacy, you have the Oriental diplomacy, uh, you have the Ottoman diplomacy as well, right? Uh, guys, if you didn't know Ottoman diplomacy, uh, so the Ottoman Empire was very prevalent in the Middle East, okay? Uh, the same thing as what you have, you know, the, you know, of uh, the Mughal Kingdom in India as well. They rule for a long time. So we have a question here, guys, by Elsa. Are you a teacher? Okay, Elsa. Um, no, I'm not a teacher. I'm just a regular human being here. I usually do podcast or video podcast every uh, twice or thrice a week. And I try to keep my promise to my viewers that I do, uh, you know, uh, make my promise to come online. So, so I usually talk about, you know, any topics, um, anything that interests me or I think about, you know, during the week. And I decide to do some research and maybe, um, you know, talk about it and also, you know, get comments and, you know, uh, we'll try to debate, which is, you know, which is uh, right and wrong and we'll try to find some solutions. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much for your question, Elsa. I appreciate it. Okay. So guys, uh, I'm just going back to the, the kind of diplomacy that I was talking to you about uh, when it comes to, you know, multilateral diplomacy and also bilateral diplomacy. So back in the day, I would say, you know, it was definitely very bilateral. Okay. Uh, and what I mean by bilateral is when there's two, the receiving state and the sending state, uh, they kind of do, you know, what they, what diplomats do, which is, you know, communicate between the two parties or the two nation states or the two countries, right? So uh, that's what, uh, you know, bilateral diplomacy means, okay? So there's two countries, they're uh, speaking to each other. So, but, you know, I was talking to you about multilateral diplomacy, okay, and you also have the American diplomacy, which is very much related to the conference diplomacy, okay, because you always uh, go back to uh, Wilson's 14 point and also the United Nations, which was pretty much, uh, you know, championed by the United States uh, and uh, the Allies, okay. You have the Oriental diplomacy, you have Ottoman diplomacy, right? You have Chinese diplomacy, you have Japanese diplomacy, you have the Indian diplomacy, right? And you have the Venetian, Venetian diplomacy, sorry. Uh, then you have the Alaka tablets and you have the Amarna letters, okay? So we're talking about, you know, going also the Greek diplomacy and the Roman diplomacy, but I would say Roman didn't really have a kind of a very, strong diplomatic corps per se, because they were very, um, you know, very rational and they always fought wars and uh, they weren't very diplomatic <laughs> per se. Uh, but anyways, so we have a comment here. 
very one went. What was that? I don't understand very one went, but uh, nevertheless, thank you for your comment. So guys, uh, this is a very interesting topic here, okay? Uh, multilateral entities. So multilateral entities, uh, what I mean is like companies, you know, organizations, banks, private banks, you know, um, industries, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the growth of technology development and uh, which has ceded some powers to the multilateral, um, you know, diplomacy uh, through, you know, through those entities, right? Though not as much as it was, okay, uh, initially, okay. Well, I don't think that uh, that's right, but okay. So guys, I'm just gonna move on here, okay? This is a quote by, um, who is this guy here? Oh, Campbell, okay. So anyways, I'm gonna quote another one here. His name is Alan Millward, okay? Al Alan Millward, he was, I think his, he was a, you know, he was a policy writer in, uh, you know, international uh, relations, you know, academicians per se. Uh, so he wrote about how the EU was the rescue of the nation state because it was able to tackle problems which were too big for any one state to tackle their own state, okay, their own. Uh, this kind of goes back to, again, the nation state that I've spoken to you about in my previous podcast. So let's move on from here. Okay. Okay, in the wake of Cold War, right, many thought that transnational challenges would further erode the state and significantly increase the power of multilateral agencies. Okay. While the ECB, guys, what is ECB? ECB is the European Central Bank, okay? European Central Bank now enjoys considerable power across the Eurozone and the world. The financial crisis in the 2008 reminded the world of the need for state regulation of the economy, okay? Because, um, you know, because of the, you know, uh, the, the power that was given to them, right? It was, it was, it kind of, there was kind of a need for regulation as well, right? And the international economic order. Uh, so there was a need for regulation of the economy and uh, international economic order, okay? So again here, Campbell cites here that it was an academic that it was an academic at this university, John Eatwell. Okay, so John Eatwell is also an author. Okay, guys, uh, John Eatwell he wrote the book Global Finance at Risk: The Case of International Regulations. Okay, which was published in two thousand. Okay, in this book, okay, it proved to be a prophetic piece. Okay. At the time, he warned against the weakened national financial regulations and the absence of power regional, uh, absence of a proper regional and global regular, regulatory framework. He pointed out that the financial markets were not self-regulating and warned the derivatives related collapses. Okay. So basically what he was doing is he was kind of like highlighting the need for a global form of economic authority. Okay. That's pretty much it. So yeah, definitely. So when you know when a particular, say, a company goes to rich, okay, um, for example, Amazon, you know, a lot of politicians, like for example, you know, uh, people like Andrew Yang, who's the who, well, he dropped out from the presidential candidate for America, okay, 2020. Um, he basically he wanted like some kind of a regulation on. Uh, the tax laws, which was kind of like, you know, you know, messing up the economy of America, per se, because what Andrew Yang was championing was that, you know, companies like Amazon, which is one of the most richest companies in the world, usually uh, Amazon, Facebook, you know, Google, eBay, they don't usually pay taxes, you know, uh, whereas the regular, you know, average, you know, uh, Joe and Michelle uh, pays, you know, uh, exorbitant amount of taxes, uh, which sometimes they cannot afford to go by, you know. So, um, and so that's I think that's a lot of um, kind of the narrative that comes from, you know, people in, 
from the kid, uh, academia or intellectual uh, world where they kind of, you know, see that there is a need for uh, kind of like, you know, bringing about a leveling playground where, you know, every uh, everybody enjoys the economic freedom per se in a society or, or a country, right? Um, so anyways, um, Following the 2008 financial crisis, it was the state that had to rescue the banking system, right? So what happened uh, to Greece as well, guys? So Greece went bankrupt, right, not too long ago. And who backed them up? It was China. China came to the rescue. China basically said, all right, okay, Greece, uh, I think what you're facing now is you're pretty much uh, having a big problem with your economy and you pretty much crashed out and burnt out, okay? So, you know, the European Union was not very reluctant to uh, come to the rescue, or at least it took a little longer time. And what happened? China came along, China said, we're gonna bail you out, okay? And what happened? So exactly what this author is saying, Following the 2008 financial crisis, it was the state, okay? Who is the state here, okay? The state is China here. Um, so basically a nation state, okay? It's a country. The country came and it had rescued the banking system. Say, for example, Greece. I'm gonna give you another example here, okay? The banking system, uh, let's say, okay, Sri Lanka. Okay, Sri Lanka, what happened to Sri Lanka? they went bankrupt too okay and also uh, they were not doing very well in trade as well because uh, i think their economy was uh, not doing very well i would say and what happened was well basically you know china said you know what okay what we're going to do is we're going to come and we're going to invest in a country and we're going to invest in billions and billions of dollars and we'll actually give you up loans okay and uh, loans with you know, well, you do have to pay back the loans, but it was it was uh, it was a very kind of a a good deal, I would say. That's why they went they went along, okay, uh, with very low interest as well, I would say. Um, but anyways, so China built a lot of ports in Sri Lanka, and guess what? Why do you think Bangladesh is, you know, uh, their economy is going very up now, okay? One of the reasons is because, you know, there's a lot of investment in the industrial sector by China and the United States, okay? Uh, so China, if you look at what's happening in Bangladesh as well, China has been investing a lot of in the infrastructure as well. And, um, you know, so is, you know, so is Africa, which is benefiting from, you know, the Chinese uh, investments and bank loans and all that stuff, and their economy is going up. So, you know, well, the financial crisis um, makes, you know, uh, banking look weak, but sometimes countries, they always come to the rescue, right? We have another question here, guys. So this is by Captain Zach Sparrow. What? Okay, so we have some grammar mistakes here, but let me try to phrase this question here. What do you think would be that? Okay, what do you think? would be the ultimate influence of the Greek philosoph philosophies toward Nagas, okay. Oh, well, uh, I would say, hmm. I'm not gonna quote too much on the philosophy aspect because, you know, I haven't gone very deeply into the Greek philosophers per se. I know they're awesome philosophers, but, you know, I'm Jack Sparrow. I think uh, for me, like, uh, I would definitely, uh, you know, uh, tr try to avoid that question because uh, I kind of, you know, have to re recollect what I studied during my first year in my bachelor's. And I don't really recollect uh, the Greek philosophers uh, per se. But I think I like their, you know, I like their, you know, infra yeah, I like their design. I like their architecture. I think definitely we can uh, we can use some of that as well. You know. Okay. All right. So I was talking about finance and banking, right? Okay. 
You know, so over over time after the 2000 financial crisis, what happened? Uh, banks were renationalized, okay, and brought back under tighter national controls. So obviously this is going to happen, right? So the neoliberal Washington consensus policies pushed by the IFI no longer held sway. Faith in sound finance, right? Hard money, free trade, and limited government came under renewed scrutiny. Okay, so we have another here. Attempts at Doha, okay, Doha to find a new World Trade Organization deal failed, okay? Doha is a place, okay, guys. On the political front to the... On the political front, too, the old-fashioned state showed signs of resurgence with bilateral territorial disputes between China and a host of neighbors, and Russia's recent expansion of its interest in its neighboring territories, okay? So, guys, uh, if you didn't know, okay, I think, like I said, you know, okay, there is always, okay, with globalization, we have a lot of multilateral uh, parties and entities which come together and kind of, you know, do diplomacy, okay, per se. But when we have a financial crisis, uh, say like in 2008, what happens is, you know, banking in particular countries or even private banks or, you know, even state banks, sometimes uh, they, they kind of burn up, okay. And that's when, you know, bilateral ties kind of comes back again, you know. Uh, there's always, uh, there's a saying, guys, that history always rhymes. And I think this was, I don't know if it was said by, it was said by Shakespeare or somebody like that. Uh, something about history always rhymes, like, uh, like water or something like that. But anyways, uh, so, yes, bilateral, you know, diplomacy comes back when, when there's a financial crisis, per se, you know. Okay. Okay. So if you didn't know what's happening in China as well uh, and Russia, the the whole you know bilateral ties with Russia and China is that well, Ru Russia was expanding before Cold War. Okay, they had one of the best technologies in the world, and they were you know they were doing very well, I would say, economically too. But they invested more on military. Okay. And guess what happened? You know, uh, United States overtook the Sputnik, you know, satellite went through. Okay. Well, the Russian was first, but uh, I think the American was more successful, you know. Um, so over time, China became the next big brother. Big brother first was Russia uh, in the, you know, in the USSR. Uh, era. Now you have the communist China, which is the bigger brother now, because they, you know, they're more richer, they're more influential, they have more multilateral and diplomatic ties with many other countries, you know. So, you know, there's a globalization. Yes, you know, there's a platform for globalization for every country or, you know, every community uh, to take part in this kind of like um, narrative, but you know, um, there's always the old that always rhymes again. There's always the old sayings and the old doings. Uh, there's always some kind of a, you know, uh, remnant to it that it never, never ends. Okay, that's uh, that's what I wanted to point it out. All right. Okay. So we have uh, a lot of viewers here, hundred plus, I would say. Well, it's nice to meet you guys. Thank you for joining in. So globalization for our purposes, uh, okay, and for this whole podcast, okay. Uh, so let's just put it this, this way, you know, it, we are living through this era of globalization, no doubt about it, okay. Uh, but it's neither um, different from what it was in the past, uh, nor, you know, it is, you know, how it's changing over time. So I hope you get that. Okay. All right. Okay. So guys, uh, I just want to point out about the banks and the finance, you know, finances of uh, of some of the companies that is, um, you know, that is thriving nowadays, guys. So like I said, you know, what globalization does is it. I'm guys. So we have a question here, Elsa. I'm a political science student, but I know nothing. 
<laughs> well, you know, um, hey, you know, I, I won't say follow your, follow your passion now because I think, you know, uh, sometimes if you force yourself to learn something that you don't want, um, maybe you might want to shift some gears, you know, and uh, change your major. And that's my advice, you know. Guys, so people, uh, so maths, I think there's a lot of people who needs a lot of, you know, mathematical and scientific skills in the in the northeast part of India per se and uh, I would encourage people to go into that line it's a very interesting line for me personally uh, I did uh, statistics and I I, I kind of uh, struggled a little bit but I you know I, I had fun doing statistics uh, and I did a little bit of economics also so that was interesting and I would really encourage you guys to kind of uh, uh, go for it so we have another comment from Elsa here. Um, international relations is tough for me. Okay, hey, don't get me wrong. You know, it's 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 definitely tough. You know, it, it touches on pretty much uh, everything that is evolving around the world. And I used to tell my viewers sometimes that you know, international relations or diplomacy per se, it's almost like you know, you're you're watching the news every morning and every evening. You're following, you know, the tragedies of the world and you're following the ups and downs of the world. And, you know, uh, so it's almost like you're feeding the dragon's fire, per se, because, you know, uh, what, you know, what happens uh, around the world is not usually uh, picture perfect, you know, and it's not very pleasant sometimes. Uh, but that's my definition of international relations. All right, I'm going to be speaking about diplomacy now. So, so guys, the question here, okay, the question here is, has globalization changed the nature of diplomacy, right? So that brings us, obviously, what uh, is diplomacy, right? And uh, how we can, you know, kind of like uh, stick this diplomacy in our narrative and uh, where, you know, you know, we can sort of find some solutions here to the answer, okay, uh, and the question as well. So, guys, if you didn't know, diplomacy is as old as humanity, okay, and one of the authors, uh, Cohen, he wrote in uh, the Amarna Diplomacy, in his article, Amarna Diplomacy, he quotes, he says that diplomacy, okay, okay, there is nothing new under the sun, okay, basically, He's, he means that diplomacy uh, is as old as the sun, okay? So, I've already spoken to you what is the, the kind of like the history of diplomacy in my uh, previous podcast, okay, guys? So, I did, I did a, a very interesting kind of uh, the anatomy of the, you know, the modern diplomacy per se. And I won't go too much into it. So, I, so I'm just going to give you a very brief account of what I spoke about the history of diplomacy per se, okay? Number one, I spoke about uh, Near East diplomacy. Number two, okay? Okay, number two, I spoke about the genealogy of diplomacy in classical Greece, okay? And number three, actually, I spoke about diplomacy in uh, the Roman world, okay? So I don't, I'm not going to go too much into it, okay? But... Uh, yeah. Okay, so Harold Nicholson, okay, he says, he's a writer, okay, and he's a uh, former diplomat, UK diplomat. He says, diplomacy is neither the invention nor the pastime of some particular political system, right? But it is an essential element in any reasonable relations between man and man and between nation and nation, unquote. Okay, so this kind of uh, diplomacy, okay, the manner that he put it, okay, you know, it talks about one of the most uh, essential ele elements, you know, so which is the essential element here is communication between man and man or man to woman or woman to man, right? Or uh, between nation to nation or nation state to nation state, you know, or country to country or um, community to community or tribes to tribes, okay? That's kind of like the classical definition of diplomacy, right? 
And he also says, but diplomacy is the art of building, and I dare say, using a relationship for a particular end. It can be used by individual groups or states. Uh, so, but anyways, uh, we're not going to talk too much about uh, personal diplomacy, like uh, person to person per se, although I do advocate for that. But our main motive for this, um, you know, podcast is state to state diplomacy, okay, uh, which is state to state uh, communication, state to state relations, um, uh, and so on. Okay, so guys, I'm going to be quoting again from Nick Nicholson here, and I'm going to be quoting from G.R. Berridge. Okay, so these are very, very prominent diplomatic uh, authors here. Okay, and I think uh, I, I have to quote these people in order for me to like uh, feel at ease. Okay, that uh, you know the legends have said it, and I need to say it as well. Okay, so diplomacy, according to Nicholson, is I quote the need to be informed of the ambitions, weaknesses, and resources of those with whom one hopes to deal, okay? So G.R. Berridge also says, diplomacy is a political activity that enables actors to pursue their objectives and defend their interests through negotiations, which no use of force, propaganda, or law it consists of communications between entities designed to achieve agreements, tacit or explicit, formal or informal. Such communications and its achievements can be facilitated by gathering information, clarifying intentions, and engendering goodwill. Okay, so that's diplomacy according to uh, G.R. Berridge and Nicholson. Okay, 